Welcome to the HC Insider Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the commodities sector and the people within it. I'm your host, Paul Chapman. Today we're doing a check-in on the metals market, in particular copper, aluminum and steel. How are these markets faring in a world of energy transition and deglobalization? Our guests are Sarah McNaughton and Charlie Durant, both research leaders in the sustainability research team at CRU, the independent research consultancy providing data and analytics in the metals, minerals, and fertilizer markets. As always, you can support the show by leaving us a five-star review, even a written review on the platform you're listening on. And I hope you enjoy the episode. Charlie, Sarah, welcome to the show. Pleasure to be here. Hi, Paul. So I'm looking forward to this this discussion. I guess in the wake of of LME Week, also COP27, we're going to do a bit of a deep dive into the copper, steel, and aluminium, aluminum markets, and what the year's held for them so far, and then what we might look out for next year as well. Before we go too far, obviously sustainability, energy transition has really been a core driver of change and opportunity within this sector. Can we perhaps start with you, Sarah, just give us a kind of a a sweeping overview of energy transition's role in the metals markets year to date, and, and what, if anything, has been surprising about that? It's probably good to start by taking a step back. I think anyone reading the news recently couldn't fail to miss the doom and gloom headlines that we've seen. To quote Antonio Guterres, we're on the highway to climate hell at the moment. And that's because for all the net zero pledges that we've heard from corporates, from governments, global emissions are still rising year after year. You know, To be on a 1.5 degree pathway, emissions we need to half between now and 2030. So falling at a rate of around 9% per year. And instead, they're increasing at a rate of around 1%. So... Lots of work needed to change this around, and quite frankly, we shouldn't be naive about the scale of the challenge. Delivering this size of emission reductions will require change across every sector, not just the easy stuff, and change at a pace that we've not really seen before in history. So rewiring, retooling systems across the economy that have taken decades, if not centuries, to put in place. So that's maybe the starting point and pretty uh, doom and gloom, but there are reasons to be optimistic, particularly from a commodities perspective, right? So yes, we're not going fast enough, but there is growing consensus about the direction of travel that we need to be going in. We're moving from pledges to implementation. We're starting to see and get a more detailed view of which technologies will be needed to achieve decarbonization. And many of these changes create huge opportunity for the metals and mining industry, because at a fundamental level, we're moving from a fossil fuel to a minerals intensive energy system. And this is generating a huge amount of interest across the commodity sector, across our clients, whether it's the prospect of rapid demand growth, new end use markets, or demand for greener and more responsibly produced materials. There's also been, I guess, you know, this year, and we're still talking in generalities here, you know, it's been a, a highly volatile year, obviously with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, You've had you know, the impacts there as well as various carbon policies, expectations around that and border tariffs and so forth. Can you sort of, I guess, give us that, Charlie, that backdrop of the sort of the macro geopolitical and economic background to what's going on in the metals market? Yeah, I think the the energy crisis for me is really typified in Europe and what you're seeing happening across a range of industrial processes and pressures in Europe. And just to give an idea of the scale of the problem for, say, EU aluminium smelters, well, if you were an EU aluminium smelter 100% exposed to spot power prices right now, that wouldn't even cover your LME price. So it's not really surprising you've seen such dramatic cuts in Europe. Our calculations put that at about 1.1 million tonnes of of closures in Europe. Now that's about 46% of EU output and I think there's there's going to be more. So within aluminium smelters that are exposed to short-term or spot power contracts or costs they're going to be forced to curtail output and I think there's going to be more incoming and I think for aluminium the bigger question now is going to be what is permanently closed. So, as you said, there's also that that twin effect of 
purchasing decisions as well because Russia used to supply a lot of aluminium into the European market as well or, or still does in some instances so really a lot of pressure there on on the aluminium sector within Europe. Yeah and then I guess Sarah talking about sort of with energy transition lens on there's been a lot of talk and and this goes back to something they say Jeff Curry in a previous podcast has been talking about of a recognition within Europe, within the US, uh, within the West in general of security of supply, critical metals, and actually, you know, rather than a, a more globalizing world where we find the lowest cost producer, new factors are at play. How is that changing the landscape of, you know, whether governments choose to support manufacturers who are struggling, etc.? I think it, you know, really brings the issue to the fore. I mean, anyone with any familiarity with the commodity sector knows, for example, the dominance of China across a whole raft of, of different metal and commodity markets. If you zoom in to some of those green supply chains, so talking about things that go into EVs or into, say, solar panels, and as dominance gets even more extreme, you're talking kind of between 70 to 90 percent market share, depending on, on the supply chain step. And you know, well, as analysts, we've been observing this for quite a few years now. It seems certainly in the wake of, of the invasion of Ukraine, that policymakers have woken up to this. We're seeing a raft of policy and legislation coming through, really trying to, to address this vulnerability. I think you're right. The US is by far and away the most advanced here. We had their Inflation Reduction Act come out earlier this year, really trying to incentivize mostly through carrot stick, uh, policies carrots as well as policy sticks. It's manufacturing base to to reshore and friendshore some of these supply chains. So looking at particular tax incentives for EVs that reward manufacturers who are who are sourcing their materials from perhaps the, the friendly um, or domestic supply chain there. We're also seeing in initiatives more broadly. So obviously semiconductors, solar panels is also quite a, a hot area for, for conversation. And then we're going to see probably more legislation. The US is the most advanced, as I say, but Europe's looking at bringing through its own raw materials strategy. We've had announcements from Australia this year as well. So I think it's definitely an area to watch. And ultimately, we're going to see some shifting away from those, those global supply chains that have been so dominant in recent decades. So more of a regionalization. And I think that comes with its pros and cons. So I think diversity of supply is always a good thing. I think COVID supply shocks, et cetera, have have taught us the, the danger of having supply chains that are too concentrated. At the same time, there's a reason the globalization has developed the way it has. It's you know, cost effective. And so reshoring some of these supply chains will have implications for inflation as well. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. So let's, let's turn to copper. Copper is obviously one of those metals that sounds like it would certainly win from energy transition and the electrification of everything on the flip side. You know, we've had uh, startling images of China blowing up multiple tower blocks in the wake of what is, you know, a, the, the emergent debt crisis and a, a potentially a real estate, well, a real estate bubble. Charlie, can you just give, I guess, first off, what's the market structure for copper? Where is it primarily bought? Where is it primarily made? So, yeah, the overall copper market including direct use scrap is, a, is about 30.6 million tonnes globally. So small compared to steel um, or even aluminium in, in terms of total market size, but obviously quite, quite a high value metal. Of that 30.6 million tonnes refined copper, so copper production from a smelter is about 25 million tonnes of that. Now of that 25 million tonnes, China uses on a first use basis, so, so making some form of semi-fabricated product from it, about 13.6 so that's 55 percent of of global refined demand taking place in just one country and to put that a bit more into context if you added collectively all of the demand for refined copper from europe north america south and central america and japan and doubled it you would get roughly the amount that's used in China. So the importance of China in this market can't be overestimated. 
The other thing is I think copper's got a bit of a reputation as a barometer of global economic health. And that's because you see copper used in a very large variety of different end uses. It's used to make wiring cables that go into to a lot of things. It's got exposure to infrastructure, exposure to construction, exposure to automotive markets. So I think that that reputation is, is somewhat deserved. But the other thing that I think we really need to think about is where is copper mined? And that's another massive question. So total mined copper production is about 21.8 million tonnes. But its concentration is very high. And between Chile and Peru, you're talking about 40% or about 38% of global copper mining and then the DRC follows up at, at about eight percent and that's going to see some growth in the midterm and the other real crucial thing here is Chinese mined production is only about eight percent of the global total so a lot of the world's copper industry is about extracting copper from countries like Chile Peru and the DRC and then selling it into China in the form of cathode or or concentrate where where has and this might sound a naive question but are there green copper contracts i mean how much does requirements over sustainability carbon emissions associated carbon emissions even you know as we've covered in a lot of the critical metals episodes that we've done the drc has its own issues when it comes to artisanal mining etc cetera, etc cetera. so where does that where does copper stack up in that is it kind of a a quiet little secret or is or companies out there openly re- wanting copper that's mined and refined in a in a responsible way so i think you rightly mentioned it it's about pressures on the industry so if you look at aluminium or steel obviously with the amount of emissions that come from those two sectors the pressure really there when people are thinking about purchasing and the establishment of green premier is on that decarbonization story for something like copper i think it's more about the res- responsible side of mining. So you are seeing assurance schemes like the copper mark taking hold. And I think a lot of it within copper is the focuses and the pressures are slightly different. So you'll see things like access to water being a big one or host community relations or tailing waste. And so the pressures within the the metal are slightly different. And I think in the future, how value is proportioned is going to be different as well. The other thing that I think you're going to see across metals and, and not just copper is access to markets being defined by some of these issues as well. So I think in terms of what you can sell, where it's going to be sold, who will buy your metal, premiums that are attached to those metals, that that is going to change. I think you're going to see less homogeneity across metals in, in the future as a result of some of those those pressures, be it decarbonisation or more of those responsible sourcing. And then I also think you're going to see more pressure from a legislative standpoint as well. And I think you're going to see more policies that detail what you can buy and in what ways you can buy in certain regions. And that's going to be tied into that market access as well. So more government policy pressures, depending on what your metal is and and what the challenges those metals face. And I think you're seeing a rise of the, the global assurance schemes as well to help companies navigate that. Interesting. And I guess, I don't know which of you wants to to talk to this before we move on to steel, but I guess I'm still not really clear. You've kind of got this, because there are your your copper super bulls out there, you know, with a very bullish story, and it's going to many thousands of dollars per tonne. You've got the energy transition story and the electrification of everything story, but you also have rising interest rates around the world, bursting debt bubbles, all the rest of it. That doesn't bode well for the main driver of copper consumption in the last 20 years, which has been the extraordinary growth of China's infrastructure and real estate. Where do you see copper over the next couple of years with those sort of opposing forces? Yeah, I think we need to be slightly wary of some of the really ultra bullish forecasts out there. 
I think commodities, particularly mined commodities, the further that you forecast, the bigger the deficit that you're going to end up with, because frankly, you're always going to be in the need for, for new supply. So we see the supply gap in 2035 of about 7.5 million tonnes. So that's a lot of new mining projects that are going to need to come on stream to, to fill that. But we also need to be slightly careful when forecasting, particularly in the long term, about projecting forward applications of today and assuming there's not going to be any change. So commodity markets have ways of self-correcting be that through thrifting or substitution or demand destruction as well because ultimately if you have a copper price that was twenty thousand dollars let's say which is extraordinarily high and an aluminium price that was only two or yeah, three thousand higher yeah already but then it, you need to have an aluminium price <laughs> of of something in in i would imagine close to ten thousand dollars a ton as well to stop there just being mass substitution obviously copper is a better conductor but aluminium can do the job in various different cases so yeah we are going to need more copper you are going to need to see investment into the sector not just now but through the mid to long term as well but we do need to be careful of some of those ultra bullish forecasts because for me these markets will correct someone will find a way of doing something better or smarter and while we do think that copper is going to be central to the decarbonization and greening of 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 the globe the market at the moment is still dominated by that old economy and i think you were you were talking about that a moment ago china still consumes a vast amount of copper and that copper is really in what for want of a better word is really in the old economy. So much of copper's growth is about green energy applications, but that doesn't mean to say if they grow at an extraordinary rate and far beyond what, what say the base case expectations are, then something else somewhere would stop using copper because it was price would go too high. So the market will ultimately correct. Yeah, interesting. And, and Sarah, just talking about scrap for a moment, and I, and I agree, there's there's ample opportunity for a, a rebrand on, on that phrase. But I mean, if and this is again is very simplistic, but there must be lots and lots of copper throughout housing used for pipes and so forth. I mean, now we have better substitutes in terms of you know plastic pipes, etc., whatever it might be. How vibrant is that? How much investment is going into the circular economy around copper? And is that really, uh, it, it, how much of a potential does that represent to fill future demand? I think the scrap story really varies from metal to metal. We're definitely seeing interest in that. I mean, circular economy is another one of these very common sustainability buzzwords. What does it mean? Scrap's only an element of that. You also have obviously redesigning products to use less. So similar to the thrifting that Charlie talked about as well. The main moves... Yeah, maybe talking about this scrap from a higher level, the main trends that we see are investment from kind of scrap consumers into upstream, so scrap processing, scrap collection, and so on. This is a trend that you actually already see in quite mature scrap markets. So I'd take the example of steel in the US, really common for type steel makers to, to be integrated upstream, and that's something people are increasingly aware of, and it's spreading to other markets. The other trend on scrap is on the processing. So one of the common issues with scrap, regardless of the metal, is generally speaking, you cannot make the same quality of end products as you can with kind of primary material because of the contaminants. And again, we're seeing more research going into this, uh, partly driven you know, from for CO2 emission perspectives, but also if you look downstream in the market, it's become quite common for end consumers such as the automotive sector to be starting to pledge recycled content targets on their on their products. So the appeal of recycled material is quite a quite a buzzword. It's quite a marketing buzzword and there's a lot of interest in it from that perspective. In terms of you know, can scrap solve this supply demand gap in the future, demand for these markets is going to continue to grow. Scrap supply is obviously limited by past consumption. So 
yes, of course, across the suite of metals, we're seeing those metals that were consumed in China during the boom years coming back into the market in the coming 10, 20 years. It won't be sufficient to, to fill the gap. So you will still need to see uh, primary production and also decarbonization of that primary production, be it copper, be it aluminium, be it steel. The HC Insider podcast is brought to you by HC Group, a retained search, intelligence and advisory firm focused solely on the global energy and commodity sector. With six locations across Asia, Europe and the Americas and over 50 consultants. To find out more, go to our website, hcgroup.global. There, you can also sign up for our HC Insider content for more interviews and white papers on relevant trends and talent impacts in the commodities world. Okay, so so let's move on to steel, which is definitely sort of the um, one of the major actors in greenhouse gas emissions. Can you, stay with you, Sarah, can you just set us up on the steel market itself? who's captured market share in production, where we're seeing consumption and where the energy transition plays into, into the market forces. So steel is not a glamorous metal. You know, you often hear the headlines being associated with say lithium or cobalt or copper. Steel is in the background, basically helping us live our lives. It's in our buildings, it's in infrastructure, it's in transport, probably at the, in the desks or chairs that our listeners are, are sitting at today. The reason it doesn't get a lot of attention is because it's a pretty low margin industry as a rule, but it's it's really important. You know, the size of the market is huge compared to some of these other commodities. We're talking about a market of around 2 billion tons per year. Huge. And, you know, for that point of view, that's why it's in the eyes of policymakers, particularly when it comes to decarbonization, because it contributes around 7% of, of greenhouse gas emissions. In terms of the market structure today, you know, common to other commodities, China is the dominant uh, producer and consumer, so it holds around 53% of the market today. The US, Japan, India also, also key markets for production, but it's a much more regionalized supply chain compared to, say, aluminium or, or something like copper. In terms of the, the energy transition, there's not the same concerns on, on supply that we see in other markets focus is really much more on cleaning up the, the production of steel. It's typically described as a hard to abate sector. That's because like other markets, you can't just simply get rid of emissions by purchasing a renewable power contract. Most emissions in steel are associated with the chemical process that happens. So in order to tackle that, we're having to completely change the way we produce steel. That means rebuilding plants. That's a huge challenge and, and really costly. So. In our base case forecast, we're looking at capex spending of at least two trillion by 2050 to to enable the transition of the sector. In terms of technology, hydrogen is the one you hear a lot about. Um, that's partly because it seems to be the technology of choice being pursued in Europe. That's really the region that's most advanced. The reason it's most advanced is obviously you know EU policy that we've seen. You know Europe is the the region where we've had carbon pricing in place for the longest time. It came out with its 2030, 2050 emission targets pretty early and policymakers there have been really clear to, to the commodity industry, particularly steel, that they, they need to clean up their act and, and make their contribution to emission reductions. We're looking at some of those hydrogen steel plants in Europe coming online as early as 2024, 2025, so much faster pace than we're seeing in most other markets. And there's over... 30 million tonnes of, of green steel making capacity being announced, most of which is, is due to come online this decade. And I guess staying on that green steel, who's, who's paying for that? Obviously, you've got compliance carbon markets in Europe. Is there also a premium paid for that steel? And this, is, I guess, is in the context of one of the other things that happened this year is interest rates have gone up. And that's having a sort of an economy wide impact on valuations and, you know, capex spending. I would say compared to a couple of years ago, there's much more momentum and consensus in the market that people will need to pay a premium. You know, I alluded to the capex costs earlier. These need to be ultimately passed through to consumers, even in markets with a carbon price in place. We're seeing most interest from end consumers, such as the automotive market. Again, a lot of them have scope three. Uh, emission reduction commitments, they need to purchase that material to enable them to meet them. And they've been kind of a big advocate of that. 
but it's not only automotive you know we're seeing kind of construction companies white goods manufacturers starting to to come forward and make these agreements it, i would say it's a dynamic situation i think certainly steel producers outside of europe say those in north america and so on are really watching how how negotiations are ongoing because it, you know, a lot of these projects aren't going to be online for quite a few years now so People are kind of locking into kind of memorandums of understanding or long-term agreements to to give that certainty to steelmakers to, to kick off this investment and build these plants that will be much needed. Mm. And where does steel sit? Maybe Charlie you can comment on this. Where does steel sit? Obviously, it was part of you know it was, it was almost ground ground zero for the for the trade wars between well, China and the US, uh, tariffs and so forth. It is obviously a uh, critical ind- industry four countries where does where does steel sit on the international markets in that sort of in a globalized trade context steel's huge that's the thing that i think if if you're if you're in a base metal or aluminium market the steel market is just proportionally a much much bigger market it's a far more regionalized market as well which i think is one of its interesting quirks so yeah steel is just an order of magnitude bigger and I think that's why you see it taking center stage in, in quite a lot of the discussions. It's also got a very high embedded carbon content. So if we think about the 20% of steel that moves from one border to another, so that's traded steel across national borders, well that 20% has embodied emissions roughly the same size as Germany. So it's really not a surprise that you are seeing policymakers on both sides of the Atlantic looking at what they can do in this space. Um, I think you are going to see in the future more trade measures that take into account embodied carbon. CBAM, so the European Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, is, is, is one, but I think that there are likely to be others in the future. And steel then probably followed by aluminium is going to be where a lot of that attention is is focused yeah and steel's also i mean it has historically been kind of a proxy for a nation's strength and economic might and so forth and you've seen china obviously go from being a relatively small producer to now producing nearly i think it's like 45 percent of the world's production can you just talk to that story is that going to mean depressed prices in steel for for the long term, where are prices heading in that context? Um, Sarah probably will jump in with some other bits as well. But for me, I think that the steel challenge is more on the supply side at the moment. Um, I think the industry is going to fundamentally need to change uh, the way that it is produced. And I think that that's going to come with it a very high amount of costs, both in terms of carbon, both in terms of hydrogen, in terms of how and where it sources its raw materials. But I'll throw it over to Sarah on that one. I think in terms of steel pricing, I mean, historically, the world has largely been take, dictated by the health of, of the Chinese market and the knock on impact that that's had on on trade flows and, and prices elsewhere. Similar to other markets, we see we could see more regionalization occurring in the future, and that's not necessarily just around trade measures, but also just around the way uh, or the rate of change of, of consumer requirements on the steel that they're purchasing. So Europe, US are likely to, to be ahead in terms of demanding lower emissions. Other markets will be a bit further behind and that will naturally lead to change in the relative pricing between regions. Well, okay, so yeah, <laughs> a complex story, as you say. Okay, so so moving finally to aluminum what's the charlie you know what's the demand what's the supply demand story there where is aluminum stacking up in the modern metals uh, world and and you know the, the the forces we've been talking about to date so aluminium is is a really interesting metal um typically people have said that aluminium never has a demand problem the demand for aluminium in terms of its growth over the last few decades has outperformed most other metals it's used in a huge variety of different sectors everything from consumer goods all the way through to automotives all the way through construction windows and doors so really broad end use for aluminium i think where aluminium has had more 
issues historically in terms of why it's had a <laughs> relatively low prices for quite an extended period of time is, is more on the supply side and the industry for quite a long time was dogged by by overcapacity and very high stock levels a lot of which were built up during the global financial crisis and have taken quite a number of years to be worked down or worked down through the system the other thing that you've seen is a truly monumental shift of the supply side of the industry from or really into China, not necessarily at the expense of the rest of the world, but certainly you've seen less growth or significantly less growth outside of China in terms of prime production than than you've seen within China. So like with copper I was describing earlier, you're talking 55 to 60% of global aluminium now is consumed in China, although you do see quite a lot of that re-exported in terms of either semi-finished or finished products. So the industry has, has seen huge growth over the last few decades. China has dominated that growth both on a demand and a supply basis. Interestingly, over the next five years, the demand for, for aluminium is looking, I would say, relatively soft, particularly by its standards. And that's really because China and, and the Chinese construction sector is likely to start to, to slow quite markedly, not necessarily see vast declines, but certainly slow in terms of its growth rates. The other interesting thing about aluminium is really it's kind of characterized as solidified energy and i don't think that that's an an altogether unfair assumption so vast amounts of energy are used in the production of each ton of aluminium and globally you also see as a global average around 10 tons or just a bit over 10 tons of emissions per ton of aluminium as well so for a comparatively small sector aluminium has got a very high embedded emissions i think in terms of demand for aluminium i think one of the biggest changes is actually going to be in the automotive sector and that's to do with the rise of electric vehicles and what i think you're going to see there is is not just that the amount of aluminium per vehicle is going to rise but also how that aluminium is consumed is going to change so you're going to move from automotives consuming a lot of secondary and scrap through casting applications to a lot more um, what have typically been primary metal focused applications so extrusions some increased cabling and rolled products as well now that raises a question for aluminium i think as part of this energy transition as what it does with that excess amount of of scrap now that the automotive sector won't necessarily be able to pull it all in and I think what you're going to see is changes and in innovations in sorting and scrap technologies, because at the moment it's really hard to deal with the tramp elements, so the silicon and, and the other things that come across in, in Zorba and Twitch. So big questions for aluminium in the future about just how energy intensive it is, about the amount of emissions that are produced per tonne, and about what happens in terms of where and how it's consumed. And I think you're also going to need to see changes in terms of technologies as well. So many companies are working on inert anode technologies. These are not being commercialized yet. And I think there's going to be questions as to what that brings in terms of capex for, for global smelters. Okay. So, I mean, it's quite a challenging picture out there, isn't it? You've kind of got these huge incentives and forces for change around energy transition, not least because these metals are going to be some of the winners in the energy transition. But you've also got a complex sort of geopolitical environment, you've got huge, in the case of steel and aluminum, for sure, you know, overcapacity coming out of China. And then you've got this sort of, for the first time, and it seems like, you know, for a very long time, technology research is really going to play a role in this as you find better ways of producing the metal with less energy with less carbon but also particularly on the on the circular economy piece technological breakthroughs there could have a dramatic impact i mean 
are we seeing, Sarah? I mean, <laughs> if you're in the board of a of a metals producer, a miner, whatever it might be, it, these are complex times to navigate. Absolutely. And I think one of the biggest issues is around timing, right? I mean, that's why you see, I think, much broader partnership, actually, between the upstream and the downstream at the moment. Everyone knows where the end goal has to be. But you know, local circumstances, local kind of politics and regulation will impact the, the pace of this change in, in different regions, and that will affect the commodity markets differently. It's really challenging to know when to go. There are certainly advantages for, for first movers. You know, when we looked at uh, some of the analysis into to green premia, the size of green premia across different markets will change over time. And there's obviously that initial phase where it, certainly in certain commodities, markets will be tighter and the premium will be higher. So we definitely see first mover advantages. But we also recognize the, the challenges. You know, not everyone can go quickly. Think about the fact that renewable energy is a key enabler to to decarbonizing your own assets or supply chain. Not every country has easy access to renewable energy. It's a difficult market out there. The easiest way to manage timing is looking at those partnerships, changing perhaps the structure of some of the supply agreements to try and kind of mitigate risk or reduce the uncertainty, and really taking awareness and notice of the, the specific local factors that play into it, whether it's you know carbon price policy, whether it's sourcing legislation like things we've seen in the US with the Inflation Reduction Act, all all very challenging, challenging to navigate, but equally huge opportunities for, for innovation and technology. Yeah. I mean we've certainly seen as a firm obviously, and it's been a longer term trend than just this last year, but a lot of the miners in particular have been building out trading and marketing capabilities just to get that connectivity to the downstream as you've identified, right? The greater connectivity you have with your customers, the more likely you are to be able to identify and then navigate these trends and the demands that you're seeing, which is, uh, as you know, very, very complex indeed. China plays an outsized role in this, Charlie. Are you also seeing China looking to tackle decarbonization within the aluminum and steel industries that's it's developed, you know, which are significant over the last 20 years? Are they also pushing along the same veins as well? Yeah, absolutely. I think China is probably going to approach decarbonization, at least in the short term, in a different way to either the EU or to, to North America. I think what you're seeing in Europe is largely a markets driven approach. And I think in the US, what you're seeing is policy incentives via uh, subsidies and tax breaks. Now, what I think China is going to do, at least in the midterm, it's going to be more pulling industrial levers. Now, China is a, is a different economy. It's set up differently. I think you can, you'll can you see more uh, centralization of this decarbonization. Um, I think that the government can ask industry to pull levers in, in ways that you can't see or, or doesn't happen outside of China. So through to, I don't know, later this decade, I think China's decarbonization story is going to be led more by the government and less by market forces. And then as carbon markets and other elements of the Chinese market or the Chinese decarbonization industry mature, then I think you'll see proportionally higher carbon prices. But if we also think about electric vehicles, now China or the sale of new energy vehicles in China is huge, vastly outstripping what's happening in the rest of the world. And I think within these markets as well, you're seeing Chinese corporations behaving slightly differently and you're seeing more investments through the full value chain by various different players within the Chinese uh, industry. And the one other thing that I'd say is you are seeing within the automotive space new technologies emerging in china such as the use of cheap and high powered lfp batteries that i think have taken markets by surprise so while china i don't think is going to go down the same path as either europe or the us i do think that you are going to see a decarbonization within china the other thing i'd say is that i think a lot of decarbonization is essentially a capex problem 
And China has shown time and time again, not just in, in our sectors, but in various different ones, how quick and well it can deploy vast amounts of capital and change industries quite fast. So I don't buy the story that China isn't going to do anything in terms of decarbonisation. I think just its approach to decarbonisation is going to be different. And I think historically, and if you look at China's EV targets, they're already surpassing many of them. And I think China typically under promises and over delivers. And, and much of the rest of the world, I think, could be characterised by over promising and under delivering on, on many of its pledges. You know, I guess as we as we wrap this up, you know, there's there's pros and cons for each of these metals or the narrative around them in energy transition with also all these the diversification of supply chain stories going on. Do you have any sense of which one of these metals is going to bear the best in in the world as we've described? I think all three out of copper, aluminium and steel are going to see very significant changes. I think in terms of the supply gap, just looking at, at the difference between capacity and demand, well then copper is going to be the one to watch. But as I said, we're going to need to be slightly careful of some of the ultra bullish stories out there because copper simply can't go to some of the really extreme prices that have been been laid out because the markets were self-correct. So I think copper is going to see a pretty significant supply gap opening. I think aluminium is very interesting because you are going to see more regionalization, you're going to see green premier, and I think you're going to see winners and losers within that sphere itself. Also, aluminium has grown very well in terms of its demand and will see some demand growth as well. And steel, for me, it's such a massive part of the global industrial sector. It's going to have to receive a lot of investment over both the short, mid and long term, if it's going to decarbonize, we're talking trillions of dollars. So vast amounts needed to be done in steel. So lots of exciting investments and lots of exciting changes, I think, coming yeah. for all three of those sectors, actually. I, I watched a, a panel at a recent conference where the, the head of a real estate group was saying that actually to, to decarbonize real estate, to go back and re-engineer all of our households for energy efficiency, all of more importantly, office blocks, tower blocks. It's like a, a $20 trillion investment just for the United States alone, which is extraordinary. Talking to that point of the, just the level of investment needed to achieve energy transition. Maybe Sarah, Sarah I guess same question to you and, and final comments to you on kind of, you know, where you see these markets playing out in the, in the short and medium term. I think to me, we know markets like aluminium and steel have, historically challenges with with profitability where the really interesting opportunities are are those kind of short to medium term gaps where there's a potential run up of demand for greener material exceeding the, the pace at which those the supply can come online that's definitely an area to watch i think more broadly it's very easy being you know, living and breathing commodities to only focus on prices or changes on supply the piece that's not really talked about so much are the kind of demand changes that could happen. So not just green growth, but getting more efficient at the way we're using materials, things like car pooling, car sharing and so on. So I think for me, that's something that's underappreciated in the market um, and it's, it's, it's a trend to watch out for. So don't just focus on on the excitement on the supply side. Demand has a lot that could potentially change in, in the decades ahead. Mm. Well, I mean, what a time to be an analyst, right? Your predecessors had a far easier job, dare I say, than it is today, trying to navigate all of these forces coming together, you know, demanding change, you know, geopolitical forces. I mean, it's a really is a, I think what all I'm taking away from this is just how complex the picture is to be able to give any kind of view. Absolutely. So scenarios are where it's at. We all know, you know the end point that we're going to, there are multiple paths that we could be, that we could get there it's likely to vary a bit by region. So I think scenarios are, are really key to understanding the potential uh, size and magnitude of, of the outcomes that we all face in the coming years. Yeah. And it's, you know, you're stepping outside the typical world of supply and demand. And, you know, there are a lot of other actors from policy through to 
consumer demands that are, that are playing in, all of which, as you say, Sarah, are pathway dependent. Well, thank you very much for your time. We'll include links to CRU in the, in the show notes. And, uh, you know, hope we can have you back on again after the next LME and see where we, we stand on all of these uh, scenarios. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Paul. That was great. Really enjoyed that. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and want to support the show, please give us a positive review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. To find out more about HC Insider and HC Group, a search and advisory firm dedicated to the commodity markets, visit our website at www.hcgroup.global. There you can find out more about our services and our offices around the world. There you can also find more content from interviews to insight pieces to more podcasts focused on the commodity value chains. Thanks again for listening.